Hello and welcome to YES's Toolbox, Webisode 14. Today we are covering interpersonal, we're in the interpersonal effectiveness section. Um, we are covering the skill FAST. Uh, thank you for joining us today. All right, so like I said, Youth Eastside Services is who we are. We are the leading behavioral health service provider for children and youth ages birth to 22 and we serve families in East King County. This webisode series is put on by Youth Eastside Services in partnership with the Lake Washington School District. The services we provide are youth and family mental health counseling, substance use and co-occurring disorder counseling, as well as community education and prevention programs. Myself and Kaylin are both in that last category. We work in the schools in the Lake Washington School District, which is why we're putting on this presentation for you. If you would like, you can follow YES on various social media platforms. Currently, we are not taking any new clients, um, but you are always more than welcome to check out our website for resources, as well as give us a call to see when we might be scheduling new intakes. Um, but those are the services available to you at this time. And if you would like to reach out to somebody else, and maybe 911 is not the right option for you, but they could be in crisis or you need some additional support, you can always call the King County Crisis Line 24-7. The numbers are listed right there. You can also text the Crisis Text Line 24-7, also listed right there. And if you are a teen who would like to talk to other teens, Teen Link is an option for you. It's available 6 to 10 p.m. nightly, and it's teens chatting and supporting with other teens. And you can go to their website or also give them a call. I am Delaney Nottnearis. I am the school-based behavioral health coordinator. I am a social worker and drug and alcohol counselor by training. I am Kaylin Griffith. I am a behavioral health support specialist and I'm a licensed mental health counselor associate and substance use professional trainee. Everything that Kaylin and I talk about today comes from these two resources. We are both foundation foundationally trained in DBT and YES is a DBT informed agency. The two books that we use are DBT Skills in Schools and then the DBT Skills Training Manual. If you are curious and would like any more information, please check out these <coughs> resources. Uh, Marsha Linehan is the creator and founder of DBT. Um, she's actually local here, which is pretty cool, um, but check that out if you want more info. All right, so for today's agenda, we are going to do mindfulness as always. We're gonna take a look at what our interpersonal effectiveness goals are and which goal we're kind of fulfilling today with today's skill. Um, we're going to go into FAST, which is our next acronym. We're going to give you something to try at home. And then as always, if anyone joins us live, we are also going to host a Q&A. So looking at our toolbox so far, again, last week we covered give skills and we are in our last module of this webinar series. Um, so today we are working more on those interpersonal effectiveness skills. And first, we are going to start with mindfulness. Um, so kind of like last week, I have another script for us that I'm actually just going to read. Um, and while I'm doing this, I want y'all to just listen to the kinds of words that I'm saying, the things that I'm describing. Um, this is kind of a guided visualization. Um, so just close your eyes or open your eyes if that's more comfortable for you. Get somewhere where you're feeling comfortable and kind of just pay attention to the script that I'm about to read. And this one is just called the eye of the hurricane. So find a comfortable meditation position, either sitting on a cushion on the floor or on a chair. Sit tall with your back straight, but your shoulders relaxed and let your hands rest in your lap and gently close your eyes. Let's take three deep, slow breaths to begin. And as you're breathing, become aware of your body sitting here. Notice the sense of contact between your body and the seat beneath you. Notice your feet on the floor. Notice the clothes against your skin. Now let's consider a metaphor. Within the strong, turbulent winds of a hurricane, the eye, the center of the hurricane is quiet. There is no wind and no movement there. For a moment, picture this idea in your mind. Can you visualize the strong turbulent winds of a hurricane and the inner core that is peaceful and quiet? Let's see if you can become like the center of the hurricane. Your current circumstances, your thoughts, your feelings, and the sensations throughout your body 
can be compared to the winds of a hurricane. It is possible for you to let go of all of these things for a moment so that you are no longer taking part in them, like the center of the hurricane is not taking part in the turbulent surrounding winds. To do this, start by focusing on your breath. Simply breathe in and breathe out and focus inward. Just like the eye is deep within the hurricane, your eye is deep within you. Use your breath to connect to this part of you and simply breathe in and breathe out. Stay connected to your breath. If anything stressful happens in this moment, such as negative thoughts, unpleasant feelings, annoying sounds, difficult life events, memories, try to look at them as if they are the turbulent wind of the hurricane whirling around, continually changing, unpredictable in nature. And notice that you are not them. You are the silent center of the hurricane, the part that is peaceful despite what might be happening around you. You are the silent center of the hurricane, peaceful and at ease. You are not reacting, you are simply observing. Like the wind of the hurricane, these experiences are constantly moving and changing. You, on the other hand, are stable. You are not moving or being carried away by them. As you continue to breathe, notice how you move more and more towards the center of the hurricane, towards the eye. Just like the turbulent wind of the hurricane, your thoughts, your feelings, and whatever is happening outside of yourself is still going on, but you are no longer part of it. You are in a safe, peaceful place, breathing in, breathing out. As you sit here, connect to your eye, Notice whatever arises. Notice the wind of the hurricane, but do not participate. Stay in the eye. Notice thoughts, notice feelings, notice sensations. Continue to watch the ever-changing nature of the world inside and outside you. Watch from a distance with curiosity and without judgment, without reacting to what you see. No matter how intense or bad the hurricane gets, the eye is always centered, calm, and at ease. Even the most turbulent hurricane cannot hurt or harm the eye. The eye is safe. Whenever you feel you need to restore your inner peace, use your breath to connect to the silent part of yourself. Just breathe in, breathe out. It may help to visualize the hurricane with yourself at the center. It can be difficult to see the eye of the hurricane at times, and sometimes we forget the eye is there. However, it is always there. If we examine closely enough, even the strongest, darkest hurricane, sooner or later, we'll see the eye centered and constant. Now, take another deep breath, and when you're ready, slowly open your eyes. And Basil's here. Um, for anyone that just saw Basil open his eyes. Um, how was that for you? Any reflections, any thoughts come to mind with that one? Any observations? Well, I mean, I liked it. And, you know, as always, mindfulness is hard. Um, and just wanting to acknowledge that, that even us counselors have a hard time sometimes keeping our thoughts, you know, just acknowledging our thoughts and letting them go uh, in those moments. Um, because I'm a Hamilton fan, there is a song called Hurricane. And so when you started talking about hurricanes, immediately in my head, the lyrics are, you know, in the eye of a hurricane, there is quiet. And so then I just was like, I didn't oh, know yes. that. Um, yeah, in the eye of a hurricane, there's quiet. And for a moment, a yellow sky. Uh, it's a really great moment in the musical. 
Um, so, I mean, through the practice, I was thinking about that and just thinking about that image too, because if you've seen the musical or heard the musical or watched the musical on Disney Plus or whatever, um, there's a really cool moment with the production where he's like standing in the center of the stage and they have like stuff circling around him and people circling around Hamilton and there's just like debris and things like that. And it's really cool because he doesn't move, but everything else moves around him. Um, so I was just thinking about that visual as well. And just acknowledging that, yes, mindfulness is sometimes hard because we have those thoughts that pop into our head. And, we're like, and I was like, okay, I really need to be focusing on what Kaylin is saying, but now I'm just thinking about this. Um, but I really like the, the metaphor uh, and the idea of the hurricane. I thought that was really cool. All right, so for interpersonal effectiveness goals, um, as always, we like to kind of tell you why we're doing the things that we're doing, and we've been doing this in each of the modules. So today we're kind of focusing on part three, or number three, is maintaining and increasing your self-respect. That's one of our goals when it comes to interpersonal effectiveness, uh, and that's why we are talking about the skill FAST today, because that is the skill that fits with that one. And just to throw it out there, this is the order that they come in those textbooks that we referenced earlier. Just to reference anyone who might be confused, we have not done step one yet. So we have not addressed the meeting your objectives. That's actually next week, because next week and the week after go together much more. So last week we did goal number two, and now we're doing goal number three, which is a little bit weird for anyone who's a little bit more chronologically minded, but stick with us. So the goals of self-respect effectiveness is really maintaining and building your own self-respect during and after an interaction with somebody else. And that's really important because I'm sure all of us have experienced some moments where we are invalidated or we invalidate others. Um, and again, you know, we talked about the biopsychosocial model of DBT and how we're, as human beings, we're pretty bad at validating each other. And so through this skill, we're hoping that you can be able to stick to your own beliefs and your own values um, and, and stick to your own self-respect despite what the outside surroundings are doing uh, in the moment, right? Um, so for example, uh, giving up your beliefs for approval. That one is really tough. Um, I know that we always want to seek approval from a boss or a supervisor or a parent or a teacher, um, but kind of giving up that need can be tough, but sticking to what we care about the most. Um, I work with a lot of students, we talk about grades, right? And the difference between what they think is a good grade and what parents think is a good grade can be very, very different. Um, and, and just sort of ex, ex, like talking through that and you know figuring out what is it that you care about? Um, or the, on the other hand, acting helpless when you are not, um, that can also hurt your self-respect. So figuring out if in this moment, are you actually helpless? What can you control? What can you not control? And making sure that again, that you're sticking with your beliefs and values. That's kind of the main thing and the main reason for the self-respect goals. All right, so even at times when your objective is your highest priority, you'll need to use give and fast to also maintain your relationship and self-respect. So again, going back to those goals, we haven't talked to you yet about what the objective is. We'll get into that skill next week. Um, spoilers, it's called Dear Man. Uh, and then you, we went over, or Kaylin went over last week, the give skill, and today we're going over fast. And the idea of this is when you want or need something, you still need to maintain the relationships with others. And you still also need to maintain the relationship with yourself, right, in terms of self-respect. So all of these skills aren't mutually exclusive. They all work together, and you can use all of them in any moment. So at the beginning, we were talking about mindfulness. Some of the skills, you can't use them all at the same time because they kind of contradict. Uh, and you really need to be able to focus on one thing at a time. Interpersonal effectiveness skills are all kind of meant to be used at the same time. Like when you learn one, they kind of build off of each other and you can use them all in the same moment. So the idea of how we're walking through this, and again, it's a little out of order, but it's you want or need something, how do you still maintain that relationship with people with the give skill? And then how do you maintain that relationship with yourself with the fast skill? It's kind of our, our map, our roadmap here. There we go. It's like it hasn't changed. <laughs> um, so think of some examples in your own life which you have compromised your values, belief, or your self-respect during an interaction with someone. Most common examples can be feeling so angry you screamed and yelled at somebody. I know that I've done that in moments of anger. Um, don't really like that I did it, but you know, it happens. Um, bullying someone else, 
definitely have had similar experiences in my own life where I've said things that I shouldn't probably have said. Um, pressuring somebody to do something they didn't want to or lying. These are all pretty common examples for doing something that doesn't match or align with your values, belief, or self-respect. Kayleen, is there anything that you can think of that you've maybe done? I know I relate to all four of those, unfortunately. I relate to all of those too. I mean, I think it's incredibly human. I mean, and if we're thinking about these examples too, these are all potentially things that have happened while you are ruled by emotion mind potentially. Um, so thinking about like, if we have the impulse to say something that we want to say that feels really good in the moment, but maybe won't be so good later down the line. Um, I mean, I think that is a pretty universal experience where we've been like, oh, I just totally put my foot in my mouth right there. Like that was not ideal. Um, so yeah, I can easily relate to all of these. Yep. Um, other examples when you've decided to focus on maintaining your own self-respect over the relationship or the objective. Some common examples are quitting a job when you feel burnt out, um, deciding to end a relationship and declining peer pressure. Uh, those are all opportunities that are presented to us that have to do with relationships as well. Um, sometimes I think this also can be, uh, you know, a boundary setting thing too, when it comes to self-respect. And sometimes when we set boundaries, relationships do change um, or do get reduced or do end because we are figuring out how to manage that and what is it that we need. Um, I was actually thinking about the employment stuff with the last slide too, of sometimes people stay in jobs um, to avoid rocking the boat when maybe they do, the job doesn't align with their values anymore or doesn't align with what they need um, or you know they're doing things that they don't actually think they should be doing uh, that can definitely happen so fast is the again it's an acronym the mnemonic for skills being used for building and maintaining your self-respect and relationships we kind of already spoiled that for you um, but fast is our acronym for today all right, so if we are going to break down our acronym, again, just like we have been for all of our most recent acronyms, F stands for being fair. Um, so kind of more of a question just to pose, because I think being fair is a concept that we all understand. Like when I think of being fair, the image that immediately comes to mind is a young child screaming at their parents, but that's not fair. Um, and kind of that realization that like, hey, life isn't fair. Um, so especially keeping that in mind, thinking about what is fair to you? Are you always doing what the other person wants? Um, or what is fair to the other person? If you were in the other person's shoes, what would you want done? Um, if you always do what you want, you may feel worse about yourself. And if you always do what the other person wants, you might also feel worse about yourself. Um, so being fair is not just like, hey, we each get this even thing. Um, like it's my turn, you take your turn, whatever. Like that is a really great idea. And life is a lot more complex than that. So sometimes if you're trying to be fair to both parties, you can't always have it that nicely split where you get it totally even. Um, so thinking about what it actually means to be fair in any one of your interactions and what that means in terms of like honoring each side and picking where priorities are. So being fair really just means finding that balance, finding a way to balance things out so it's not always heavy laden on one side or the other, but you're kind of giving yourself that back and forth. Um, and we kind of think of the scales that really brings to mind another concept, which is dialectics. Um, so it's not that you are always prioritizing your values, priorities, self-respect of your objective over theirs. And it's not that you are always prioritizing their values, priorities, self-respect or objective, but really it's about both of you guys. It's in any given situation, you have to keep in mind what the values are, priorities are, self-respect and objective are of both parties and seeing how you can come to honor both of those, depending on what's going on. And in some cases, it's not possible to do all of that. So you have to pick the ways that you can do that the most. Um, this is just kind of, kind of a vague topic, but it's kind of one that is pretty self-explanatory. Like I think most people understand a little bit of what it means to be fair. And I think most people already understand that it's not always just, it's my way or the highway 100% of the time. Like you do have to give and take because hey, the other person has to get something out of this relationship too. Yep. Um, so if we're thinking about apologies, um, 
the way that the book actually teaches that is in terms of no apologies. And really what that refers to is over apologizing. But before we get to the problem with over apologizing, I wanted to just pause on apologies and talk about why apologies are really helpful in interpersonal effectiveness. Um, because if we're thinking about it, like there is Obviously, over apologies are a thing, but what are we doing when we actually just apologize to another person? Like, what is the point of doing that? Um, and I decided to throw up here something not necessarily from DBT, but these are actually the five apology languages in terms of like the five love languages. So the different components that different people are going to like out of an apology or respond to in an apology are one expressing regret. So the person actually saying, oh, hey, I did that thing and I feel badly about it. Um, so it's about that regret piece. For others, it's about accepting responsibility. Oh, hey, I did that thing and I know it was wrong. Um, for others, it's making restitution. So, hey, I recognize that this thing happened. How can I make it right? What can I do to kind of make up for this thing that I did? Um, and when repentance is more about like, I really won't do it again. I feel awful about it. Like it's really big on me. And like, it really will motivate me to never put anyone else in this situation again. Um, and this last piece is just requesting forgiveness. Um, will you forgive me? I've talked with a lot of people about apologies, whether or not it's been in terms of they feel like they need to make an apology or whether or not they, they feel like someone needs to make an apology to them. And in any given conversation with a person, I cannot assume which of these five things they're gonna find really important. Like I've had people say like, I do not want someone to just express regret. That won't give me anything. It doesn't tell me anything about whether or not they're gonna do it again. I don't know if I can trust this person. Um, so if you're thinking about interpersonal effectiveness and the fact that conflict is a very, very, very common thing and kind of like important thing that happens in all relationships, then apologies are gonna happen at some point. And if you wanna do it in the most effective way, knowing the way that the other person responds or what might be important for them that you express in apologizing might be really important in actually making that apology or that repair go a little bit smoother. Um, and the other thing is like, just keeping in mind that if you are expecting an apology, you might respond to some of these things over other things. So communicating to the other person like, hey, I recognize that you apologized in this way, but what I really need from you is to know that you're gonna do something different next time. Um, so if you also receive an apology that you feel like, oh, hey, that didn't quite make the mark or I still have really big feelings about this, knowing that you can go back and be like, hey, there's a component of that apology that was missing. And and it would do a lot better for our relationship if we could address that piece too. Um, so it goes both ways in this sense. Um, going into over apologizing and what I really mean by that is saying sorry for things that you don't have to say sorry for. So things like just being yourself or like being awkward. I know I apologize for being awkward all of the time um, and it doesn't make any sense or like saying sorry for like inconveniencing someone or something that like maybe the other person really doesn't mind or isn't bothered by that thing. Um, but over apologizing can easily imply that you did something egregiously wrong or made a huge mistake that you should feel badly about and keeps you from moving forward. So on one hand, it implies to the other person that, hey, I am the person in the wrong. I did the wrong thing. And it kind of takes whatever responsibility happened in that conflict off the other person. They're like, oh, great, sweet. Now they apologize. Clearly it was their fault. Um, on the other hand of that, the way that we talk about ourselves and to ourselves, again, thinking about self-respect really matters. So if we are constantly apologizing for things that happen in our world, the underlying implication that we might re be receiving in our feelings might be, oh, I am constantly at fault for things. I am always apologizing for things. I'm always doing things wrong. And whether or not those actual things that you did are wrong, constantly telling yourself, I need to apologize is definitely going to break into your mindset. Another piece is that when you over apologize, it can further frustrate other people. So if you did do something wrong, but then you cover it up with a bunch of apologies about things that don't matter, it might push people away from you in that relationship because they're like, oh my gosh, why is this person always apologizing for things? Why are they always doing things wrong? Why are they always thinking that they need to make up for something? And it might devalue that relationship before it's actually devalued while it's still really strong. 
Um, and lastly on here, sometimes people will over apologize because they want the other person to tell them it's okay for whatever they did wrong or because they're trying to decrease guilt. That can make you feel worse over time as you perceive that the only, the, the only way that you can feel better about this thing is if this other person involves you. And that's not always the case. You're putting a lot of responsibility on the other person to make you feel better when, hey, we cannot always bank on someone making us feel better after we apologize. Sometimes that is distress tolerance work that we have to do for ourselves. That's like thought work that we have to do for ourselves. It's mindfulness work that we have to do for ourselves. Um, but kind of putting that, that gatekeeping on feeling better on someone else and not on ourselves takes away our own control over our own feelings, which is also just kind of undermining yourself. Um, so one example to kind of hit this home is Sally's in the lunchroom um, and she's talking to Billy about their chemistry project. They've got this group project, whatever. They're trying to figure the things out. Sally's partner, Mike, walks in, sees them talking, rolls his eyes at Sally and walks right out. Maybe Mike's been worried about this Billy character. We don't know. Sally runs after Mike and starts apologizing for talking to Billy. So what is Sally's objective in apologizing? In this case, her objective is kind of trying to smooth things over. And that's it. But if she's just trying to smooth things over, does that necessarily mean she did something wrong that she needs to apologize for? Not necessarily, because ultimately what Sally's apologies might imply to Billy is, oh, Sally really was doing something wrong. She really shouldn't have been talking to Billy and I was totally right in rolling my eyes. Um, and if we're thinking about what Sally is validating by apologizing in this moment is she's validating Billy's concern. She's validating that he felt correctly in that moment because she's accommodating for those feelings. Um, so thinking for yourself, how do you think Sally feels about this situation now, her relationship with um, Mike? Um, how do you think she feels about herself? How do you think she feels about Mike? Um, and how do you think Mike feels in this situation? How do you think he feels about his relationship or about Billy, this potential threat that maybe was just trying to get his homework done? We don't know. Um, so thinking about, in this case, an apology is really not helpful. And thinking about just the scenario, I know if I were in the situation, if someone just rolled their eyes at me, I might run after them to apologize because that is a very effective way to maybe make them want to hear me out. And that might not fit my objective in any given situation. And it might not serve to keep me maintaining my self-respect either. All right, so for the S in fast is sticking to your values. Um, so we as therapists always talk about values. Well, maybe not always, but it is important for us to talk about values because I think of it as this way, your values whether you know them or not, do move you to action or to respond or to, to emotion in some way. And if we don't know what it is that you value, it makes it harder to figure out what it is that you care about and why you respond the way that you respond. So if we think about going like backwards from a situation, so say you have an emotional reaction to something um, and you think it's because of this thing, like you really care about this thing, but actually it's because of this thing that is really important to you that you maybe didn't actually think about or know. And we don't actually often spend a lot of time thinking about the things that we value. Um, so the idea of S in sticking to your values is you have to figure out what is it that you care about to be able to stick to your values, which I know sounds kind of odd, but if I were to ask, you know, Kaylin, what does Kaylin value? Um, you know, more likely than not, she'll have a handful of things that she knows. I don't know. Kaylin, what is it that you value? Just throw some out there to me. I value like being passionate about things that you get to do in your life. So finding something that actually like interests you. I value family. Um, I value happiness um, over like things like financial success or whatever. Like happiness is more important to me, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, I I don't know. I value growth. I think that's something that's really important as like something that helps me decide what I want to do in any given moment. Like, do I want to just sit on the couch again and watch TV all night? Or do I want to like invest time in a hobby, something that I'm really interested in growing skill in? Yeah. Um, so growth is something that I really like too. Yeah. And so I could see those values definitely impacting your actions and responses to things. So like, say if we had a situation where I was like, Kaylin, I really need you to do this thing for me at work. 
And it's not something that is going to further your growth. It's like busy work or something like that. I could foresee maybe you having a hard time doing it or not wanting to do it and being like, you know, actually, I don't think this is part of my job. I don't think I should do that um, for whatever reason. Or say maybe it's, hey, Caitlin, I really want to hang out with you. And it's a time that doesn't work for you because you normally spend time with your family during that evening. And that's more important to you. So you have a reaction to me, you know, saying, Hey, I need you to hang out with me. And you're like, well, actually I have this other thing too. Like that's going to motivate your decisions and your choices. Um, and um, if you're not very clear on that, then it's going to be hard to stick to your values if you don't know what your values are. So us as counselors, we like to do a thing called a value sort. So all of these words that are on the screen are part of that, right? Um, part of this value sort. Normally what we have folks do is we rank them and say like, what are these that are the most important, most important, somewhat important, neutral, not very important and least important and it's a really great activity to figure out what you care about because there are things on this list that really don't matter to me personally um like one of the things i can think of is um gosh i'm looking at the list um popularity like that was never a thing that was important to me um and or maybe it was important to me maybe in like high school but it was very superficial and i didn't really understand what it was whereas genuineness might have been more of a, a value to me in high school because I wanted to be around people that actually were themselves. And that was kind of sometimes in conflict with popularity as an example. Um, and so maybe I dressed a certain way or acted a certain way that aligned with those values that then of course was, you know, could create tension in friendships that I had potentially. Um, so the idea of this is figuring out what do you care about because it's only gonna give you more insight when you have an emotional reaction or you do an action and you're kind of like, wait, why did I do that? There's usually something behind it. So what makes it difficult to stick to your values? When your beliefs go against the beliefs of the group, you might struggle with being the one on the outside. Again, thinking about popularity versus genuineness. Um, I personally value authenticity, so I'm gonna be my authentic self versus somebody that somebody else might want me to do or be, but that's not often the case. And sometimes it's really hard. And I know I've been in situations where I've done things just to align with the rest of the group, um, even if I didn't really want to do that. There we go, all right. So this is an example of a kind of a lighthearted example. This isn't exactly someone giving up their values or anything major like that, but it is an idea of like when there is a group that feels a certain way and you are maybe the only one or you perceive you're the only one that is different, it's really easy to kind of just give that up in favor of going with the group. Um, humans are social creatures. It is really, really biologically important for us to fit in with a group. That is something that is one of our base desires. Um, so this is kind of a lighthearted example. It's the elevator experiment. You might've seen this in a Psych 101 class, um, but we will share the video so you can get the information for yourself. <laughs> So you walk into an elevator and naturally you turn and face the door, right? It's just what we do without even thinking. All right, in the blue t-shirt, that is Nadia. She is an innocent passerby. Has nothing to do with this. Everybody else in that elevator, they all work for Wait. Would You Fall For That? They are all in on the experiment. They are all purposefully facing the wrong way. Nadia is facing the front. You can just see the back of her head wearing the blue t-shirt. That's Nadia. She is facing the front of the elevator like a normal human being. Everybody else is facing the back. We're playing this to you in real time, no editing, as it actually happened. Okay, floor two. Rebecca gets off. Emily gets on. She also works for us. We're swapping people in and out to reinforce the behavior. Emily's acting like it's the most normal. Oh, Nadia's turned. Nadia, it, okay, her bag is slipping off her shoulder. She's nervously playing with it. Yeah. Nadia's now halfway round. Will she go any further? Emily gets off, Mike gets on. Again, Mike works for the show. Presses his button, faces the back like it's the most normal thing in the world, like he does it every day. Nadia is really feeling the pressure right now. I'm not gonna see anyone else. Scott's making some small talk. He was on celebrity rehab, I think. 
She's looking towards the back of the elevator, because everybody else is. Floor four. Fourth floor, Mike gets off. Lauren gets on. Lauren also works for us. She's in. Oh, and Nadia, Nadia, Nadia has gone. The fourth floor, Nadia has turned all the way around. She's looking at the back of the elevator. That is not normal human behavior. Nadia is looking at the back of the elevator purely because everybody else is. Okay, you've seen it in real time. Let's play that for you again in Fast Forward. Oh, stick Aww. under your values. <laughs> Poor Nadia. <laughs> An amusing example. <laughs> yes, funny. yes, yeah. All right. So the T in fast is be truthful. So what impact can lying have on your self-respect? So. Lying is a rather judgmental label. Um, and what are ways in which we're not always completely honest, right? <laughs> it just makes me laugh because when we were talking about values, I was totally going to make the joke about, you know, like resume building words, right? Like I value organization. I value, you know, like what is one of your weaknesses? Oh, well, one of my weaknesses is I just am a perfectionist. You know, <laughs> that takes like, you know, what are your val? Like, what is it that you're good at that your strengths that you can phrase to be a weakness when you do these interviews so it makes me laugh because resume building um for uh this uh totally makes sense to me as well as just interview answers sometimes i mean of course mm -hmm. we all inflate ourselves a little bit um but what what does that sort of do how can that impact our self-respect and it can have a pretty pretty big impact um other ages are acting helpless even though we know what to do um that can also just send us so basically thinking about what signals do we send others and then what signals do we send ourselves? You know, like Caitlin mentioned with the apologizing thing, if I'm over apologizing, I'm inadvertently sending signals to myself and my brain that I'm always at fault for things, right? And if I am acting helpless, even though I know what to do, I'm still kind of sending the signals to myself that maybe I really don't know what to do. Like I'm invalidating myself in a way by lying sometimes. Um, ghosting a potential relationship. <laughs> lie of omission i don't know it's I not guess. totally up and honest and truthful well it's yeah like if, well if i mean for, i think for that it's if you're you're saying you're interested in a relationship just in general and then you ghost somebody like are you really interested in a relationship then? like maybe there's some things you have to figure out like maybe you're not ready for a relationship and thinking like figuring that out um white lies designed to lessen potential hurt that one's a tough one uh, and I struggle with this one myself because I, I'm in the habit of, you know, being a therapist because I am a therapist and <laughs> I often will say things um, sometimes nicer uh, and inadvertently invalidate myself, right? So, so like somebody will do something and really realistically internally, I'm like, I'm fucking pissed. Oops, I said that. Sorry, I dropped the F-bomb. <laughs> uh, I'm really pissed or whatever it is. Um, I wonder if we're going to get in trouble for that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, bonus points to anyone that points it out. <laughs> yeah, I am. So, you know, like, but that's the thing, right? Is I, I will, that's internally, like, I'm really mad. I'm really upset. And then what I'll say outwardly, though, is something along the lines of like, yeah, so maybe what you did wasn't my favorite thing. And, you know, where is I'm invalidating my own emotions by saying, saying things in a, in a, a lesser way, right? Um, or again, so lying of omission, leaving details out of like, when you did this, it really hurt me versus like, oh yeah, well, I'm over it now. Um, it's, it's, it's what are, what messages are we saying to ourselves that I think is the part of being truthful, um, when it comes to lying, are we lying to, a, when we lie, how, what are we telling ourselves when we do it? Or what are we not acknowledging when we do it? And I chose these examples on purpose because I, at least, I'll have a human moment for y'all. I do all of these. Resume building, absolutely. Acting helpless, occasionally. You know, if it's a lot easier to make someone else get the spider that's in the corner of the room, I'm going to make someone else get the spider. Um, I've ghosted folks, like, like either friendships or whatever. I've just, like, not been interested in talking to them again. So I ghost because I'd rather say that than I'm not interested. Um, white lies, you know, lies of omission, like whatever. Um, I think lying is really, really, really human. And I want to take a moment and recognize why people would do that. Like the goal of lessening potential heart is really important. Resume building, you need a job. So trying to make yourself look better so you can get a job, so you can get paid, so you can afford groceries, that is important. There are reasons why we do these things. Mm -hmm. And 
ultimately, if we think down the line, what is the impact overall, like after the mountain has been dug out, whatever, that this is having on my self-respect. Um, one of the things that comes to mind is this, again, this, I've used a lot of examples from friends already, um, but there's a scene where Joey put, he's an actor on a sitcom and he put some things, some skills that he has on his resume. And then he has to go to audition and leave the audition because their dance instructor's out and he can't dance. So what is he gonna do? Um, like thinking down the line, what the impact of like, how much of the lie is it? How much of the truth did you bend? Is it really close to the truth or not? Um, that can have a big impact later on your self-esteem as well. Um, so are the fast skills only needed when self-respect is our top priority in an interaction? Or are give skills only needed when our relationship is our top priority in an interaction? And just because we choose to prioritize an objective, our relationship or our self-respect does not mean we can't still attend to all of them. Your objective is the most important thing to you. Absolutely emphasize those skills that are gonna get you that objective. And spoiler alert, we'll get to that next week and the week after. Um, if your relationship is the most important, prioritize the things related to that. But just because you prioritize something doesn't mean you can't still do the other things or still attend to those things or make sure that those things are okay. Or, hey, you know, if you are down the line getting your objective, it really looks like you're about to get it, but all of a sudden your relationship goes, maybe that's a time to switch tactics a little bit. That objective is already kind of in the bag and now it's time to attend to the relationship or now it's time to attend to the self -respect. Um, So it's a dialectic and the image that we always have for a dialectic is either those scales seeking balance or a dance, which is a little bit more helpful for understanding the give and the take, the ebb and flow that you kind of need to go through in your life. Um, so again, just to kind of nail this point a little bit more home, you can use all of the interpersonal effectiveness skills together. And in fact, it's encouraged to do it that way um, because then you're, realizing and working on each of the components of interpersonal effectiveness at the same time. Another thing to, to think about um, with this situation is, so again, the interpersonal effectiveness unit that we're on is about interacting with other people, right? So that's the context and we're in. You're interacting with somebody else because you need something um, or you want something and you're trying to get your objective done, right? Um, one of the ways I think I like to think about this is sort of thinking about buckets and either like the amount of water in the various buckets or the amount of money in a piggy bank or whatnot. So say for example, my objective is I need something from Kaylin and we're gonna go over in the next two weeks, how do we ask for what we need? But say I need something from Kaylin. I'm like, Kaylin, I'm gonna go on vacation. Actually, I did this last week. I'm gonna go on vacation. I need you to run DVD toolbox for me. <laughs> Can you do it? And you know, this is obviously before because Caitlin did do this for me. Uh, and I needed to ask that question, right? I'm like, hey, I need to do this. Now, if we think about our give skills, right? Um, thinking about what is the status of the relationship that Caitlin and I have? Are we in a good space where I can ask this of her? And it's important to kind of think through that because if we're not in a good space that I could ask this of her, am I gonna get my objective met? Like that's kind of things to weigh out. So if I'm looking at these buckets of like, what do I wanna focus on? Am I a bucket of like our relationship is really, really low? Then I might not want to put a bunch of the money of or however much I have to spend in the objective bucket if our relationship bucket is really, really low. Um, so thinking through that, of when, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about um, Dear Man and next week uh, and that skill, but it's, it's, there's multiple things at play. And sometimes like Kaylin was saying, you do need to be able to sort of pivot and focus on what seems to be more important in the moment in any given time, because you could be asking for something and then realize your relationship isn't at the place that you thought it was at. And you're gonna need to pivot and be like, oh, okay, yeah, let me, tell me more about how you're feeling right now, because that's going to impact your objective, right? Or you might need to pivot like the person will then ask you, well, actually, I want you to do this thing instead. And that's something that totally uh, conflicts with your values. So you'll have to pivot again and see like, okay, well, actually, this is something, you know, that's important to me. And it's all about, again, like a dance, right? You're going to be doing different steps and different steps are going to get you to different things, right? So thinking about it that way um, can also be helpful. 
All right, so something to try at home. Um, this is more of a reflective practice in that we want you to practice using your fast skills and then kind of reflect on two situations that happened during your week in which you were able to use those fast skills or put them to work. Um, so answering the questions, in what way are you trying to maintain your self-respect and like in what way was it compromised? What are your values that you're really seeking to like uphold here? Um, what was the situation in which you chose to use your fast skills and how did you use them? Go ahead and use your mindfulness describe skills. What was the outcome of using fast and how did you feel after using your skills? And that's it. Nice. We do not. Uh, oh, yeah. I was going to say, nice. That is what the content that we have for today. We do not currently have anybody joining us live for questions or comments. So if anybody does um, have any questions or comments, feel free to join us next time for our next episode um, or, you know, let us know. These are all going to be posted on YouTube so you can access them there. Again, forgive my moment of humanness <laughs> in, this, in this recording today. Um, but yeah, we'll wrap it up. Oh, I literally already forgot what you were talking about. <laughs> yeah, so we're not no, currently I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Five example for you all. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Over apologizing. Um, so we're not currently taking new clients at Youth Eastside Services, but feel free to reach out to us on uh, either our website or the phone number or follow us on social media to figure out when we will be offering more services or if you just need some resources. Lots of great material as well as this webinar series is on the website as well. Um, if you need to reach out to somebody else, again, the King County Crisis Line is available to you, as well as the text line, or if you're a teen and want to chat with other teens, definitely check out Teen Link. And thank you for joining us today.